Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by Dan Reed, director Hi. of Terror at the Mall. Terror at the Mall. Okay. Ter- Terror in the Mall, at the Mall. At the Mall. Okay. Um, which is, I don't know for people who remember, but it's a very detailed accounting of the terror attack that occurred in Kenya, Nairobi specifically, I believe, in 2013. Yes. Um, I remember that in a general sense, but this, I mean, really brought a very vivid portrait to it. Uh, We'll get there, but I want to start first, actually, because I didn't realize this. You also directed Terror in Moscow, which I I didn't even realize dated back to 2003, but similarly, that uh, covered the terror attack at the theater in Moscow between the, was it the Moscow military and the Chechen rebels? That's correct. That resulted in, I don't know, hundreds of deaths, 300 deaths or something like that, Um, which was one of my top five documentaries of all time. So in retrospect, I got I'm gonna, I'm not gonna toot your own too much, but um, I would put you in the same category as uh, Michael Moore, Alex Gibney, er- Errol Morris. Um, your comedy. your documentaries are so phenomenally detailed and um, honest that it's pretty amazing. Um, if you haven't seen that one, uh, definitely do it. But I just want to quickly ask, what was it like in terms of you getting into making that one, and how how did you go about it, and how did you get so much detailed footage out of that and try and whittle it down into a narrative storyline. This one? Uh, Terror in Moscow. Let's Terror start with that first. Terror in Moscow. Well, Over here. well, I was, Terror in Moscow was a gig that I was kind of brought onto, you know. Um, at the time I was, I think I, I was just about to have my first child and I thought, uh, Oof. Uh, yeah, I thought this sounds interesting, but I, I was kind of moving into drama, and I didn't that's know a that's I, a heavy heavy topic to be covering when you're like was, about to experience one of the yeah. happiest moments in your yes. life. Yeah, it was very strange, and uh, and so I thought, well, if I can do this quickly, it'll be worth doing, and um, and then and then you know, as these things have a habit of doing, it sort of it sort of tipped into something a lot a lot more uh, compelling for me as a filmmaker. Because not only did we find all these extraordinary people who had had survived the siege, you know, there were 800 people who'd gone to see a, a, a musical, you know, and and they were held hostage for I think it was 57, 58 yeah. hours. Um, and then what emerged was was video shot inside the theatre by the terrorists, like a kind of a home video thing, because you know one of the spectators had a had a video camera a Hyatt camera or something and the terrorists grabbed this and they were like hey here's my here's my homie you know what's his name and, and it's, I mean it's a really interesting thing in terms of like you think about the context context of that era too like this one I mean there's some like home video phone vid- footage and stuff like that but cell phones with cameras were not like a widespread thing at that no, point no like, I think it was just starting it was and just it, starting. it was one of the things you imagine like now if everyone had an iPhone what kind of experience yeah. that would like be to tell it now yeah. but that's really interesting yeah. that that was from the terrorists yes um, so the terrorists kind of doing selfies video yeah. selfies inside the mall um, inside the theatre uh, and, and then we got you know we got some more kind of conventional uh, footage from the outside of the theatre where uh, cameramen had, had snuck into buildings clandestinely and positioned themselves so they could film the outside of the theatre and that's where a lot of the, the tragic loss of life took place as the, the uh, spectators were brought out by kind of special forces who were drunk on the gas mm. and they were laid down on their, you know, on their backs and many of them just choked on their tongues yeah. and, uh, and, and died. I, I mean, part of what made that movie so remarkable was all the intimate footage that you had doing that. Was that something that's sort of been uh, an element that you've thought about as you've gone forward in doing these films like Terror in Mumbai and now Terror, Terror in the Mall? Yeah. Like, is that is that something that helps drive you to be like, okay, this is a project that I can see being able to tell a story in? Yeah. And what, it, what, what interests me is not just is really not, not, not being able to tell the story of what happened or, or, or you know, just relate the facts because that's partly been done before in every in each of these cases by the news media you know you often not very well i have to say yeah. because in the rush of the news cycle they don't have time to unearth what really happened but um the real opportunity for me is to tell an intimate story to go inside the event and to to really uh view it all through the optic of of 
the participants and the, the, the victims and the people who were there. And for me, that's a really precious opportunity. And often, you know, the, 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 the artifacts, the recordings that I managed to, you know, get from the, from the situation uh, are what helped me do that. You know, so, so I'm kind of using the technological side of, of you know, the fact that everything we do is recorded now uh, on b multiple angles, multiple cameras. Um, and, and that, but I, I try and use that to tell an intimate story because recordings can be very cold. They can be very inert, you know. Uh, well, that, I mean, that raises an interesting question. I mean, with terror in Moscow, like, that seems like that's as much a great opportunity because the footage existed. But nowadays, it almost feels like there's more noise, if you will, that there, there might be more projects that have crazy footage taken, especially with people on phone cameras and stuff like that. Does that make it more difficult to figure out what you want to do? Or like, do you just have a sense in terms of like watching the news, like, oh, that looks like there might be something more to that story. Maybe I should look into that more and see what's there. I mean, both in with, with, with Terror Mumbai, which is the other thing which I don't you've seen, but no, I, I'm very watching. eager to see now. I didn't even realize like, it was one of those things. It's like, ooh, this is a treat. Like, and it's sort of sad to say that because you know it's such a tragic event, and we'll really get into that with this story here shortly. But it's still like such. I mean, an incredible accounting of things that yeah, it's just like I'm, I'm curious to see learn more about something I didn't know as much about. But with, with the Mumbai film, uh, a lot of it pivoted around uh, audio recordings of cell phone conversations and these conversations were of the gunmen on the ground speaking to their, their, mm. their handlers in Pakistan so it was a kind of minute by minute uh, commentary on what was going on it was extraordinary and it was very revealing but the, the, what, what intrigued me about to do the film uh, in that case was that uh, very early on in the, news, in the news coverage a few scraps of this was released in the form of a transcript. Wow. You, you, nobody had the audio, but there was a, a, like four or five excerpts from the conversation that the Indians were using to say, look, these guys came from Pakistan, they've been controlled by Pakistan. And that made me think, well, what if you could get the whole thing? And it's the completeness of the electronic record that's important. It's the completeness that's important. Well, I mean, and you talk about completeness, that was one of the most incredible things about Terror, terror in the Mall, um, is that not only do you have like all the security footage from the mall, interspliced with interviews with the actual um, survivors, but you're able to clearly track and show where individuals are and as they move through the mall. What was the challenge like in terms of doing that, in terms of like identifying people, matching up their events and account of the thing, um, in terms of telling this narrative? Because it's, it is phenomenal. It, very much feels like you are there and you're very conscious of everything as it's unfolding mm -hmm. because you know where everyone is as the story's unfolding. Well, I'm, I'm glad you say that because one of the things which kind of plagued me at the beginning was, is anyone going to be able to understand how these cameras fit together? And is, any, you know, is, is an audience going to be able to follow action from camera to camera? Because clearly these cameras are not positioned to, you know, to, to narrate a story. They're positioned yeah. to catch people stealing or whatever. Um, and I found, I think that in the finished film, you... I had no the, problems at all. Exactly. Understand so, what was going on. And that, that's usually, uh, that was one of my big worries at the beginning. You know, I, I received the material or acquired the material in the form of, you know, a whole mass of folders with uh, files with strange codecs. Uh, often lacking a player, often, you know, uh, something that, files that wouldn't I play I can appreciate it, yeah. uh, trying to find a way to so make this stuff work. Complete, yeah. uh, in terms of just video manipulation, just a complete nightmare, because we couldn't, often couldn't just connect the files, couldn't play them. So to cut a long story short, there was a, there was a lot of work involved in just getting the damn well, stuff to I mean, that was one of the things I was, the mo like, I remember this, and I mean, you talk about, you know, how things occur in the news cycle, and this is one of those things that, I mean, in retrospect, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, like, consider more of a, but, you know, there's constantly, like, so many events globally around the world that we seem to, like, thrust these aside within a 24-hour cycle. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, like I, I didn't realize that this was just a year ago, like almost just, I think it was like August something, mm. uh, when I actually went back and looked at the date that September it was September. Okay, yeah. so it's not even a year. Yeah. What was it like in terms of trying to get that all pieced together in such a short, I mean, I guess I don't know what your timeline was to get it done, but getting it pieced together in such a short amount of time, because it seems like there's probably so much stuff to look through that you're talking like, hour, like I don't know, 30 hours from just 
these cam or I, we, we, I, we had thousands of yeah. us. So it was just like trying to sort through like, yeah. oh, there's that one yeah. minute in this one yeah. camera that I want. I mean, it's a huge, hugely labor intensive task, as you can imagine. And my editor and I just spent the, you know, weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks looking through the stuff and trying to understand what it was we were looking at, because as I say, the shots are not framed to, to show you what the camera doesn't move. It's just fixed. It's a machine recording. And often the action is playing, is playing out off camera, you know, in a corner of the frame, or whatever. And there's one amazing shot uh, for me, which kind of sums up the the power of the security camera footage. And that is that is uh, a, a moment when a, a mother of two children stands up in front of the terrorists, and she mm. survived a massacre behind in the, in the supermarket. And she stands up and she says, "You know, I, I want to go with my kids." And and you can just see her her head appear in the corner of the frame. And that, for me, is an incredibly powerful moment, partly because, you know, she's not there dead center. She just kind of sneaks into the frame. There's something about the grammar of the security camera footage, which is, you know, on the one hand, it's very alienating because it's very cold. It's just a, a machine recording things. On the other hand, it has a, it does make you feel like you're witnessing something actually unfolding in front of you. You're absolutely right on both yeah. of those points, but you actually have an ace up your sleeve, though, in terms of the footage from, was it Goran? Uh, Goran Tomashevich Gimmer Stills. Yeah. Uh, his burst photos that he does, I mean, not just outside, but actually as he goes inside mm. with the undercover or uh, plainclothes yeah. officers, yeah. and when they try and uh, help out, that is just like... I mean, I guess he's a war zone photographer in his past, so he's not afraid of, like, the danger. But, like, that footage is so polar opposite of, like, the cold, distant yeah. Uh, yeah. security cameras because exactly. it's so intimate mm. when there's some of the shots. Like, when the people behind the display are running mm. to get out, mm. when they have that one brief moment yeah. after the tear gas is thrown down, it's so, like, personal that these people have been hiding for so long, mm. and you can just see, like... They're so relieved to be. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's an incredibly personal yeah. experience. I mean, you're right. It's 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 the polar opposite of the security camera footage, which is fixed camera, very you know, very grainy, uh, very little detail, uh, and no framing. And and Goran's pictures are the opposite. They're beautifully Vibrant, framed, very well framed, rich focused. in detail. Uh, you know, I I, I thought because I I'd, I'd seen the still pictures that had been very very widely circulated uh, around the world. Uh, that he'd taken, um, and I went to see him in his office in, in Nairobi because he's the he's the Reuters uh, chief photographer for East Africa. So I sat with him, um, you know, and he's Serbian, and, uh, and I spent quite a long time in, in, in those parts, and we sort of chatted a bit. And he said, "Look, you know, why don't you just look through the pictures and, and you know have a look at yourself?" And, um, and so I started to look through, and I was like hitting the you know the, the arrow, yeah. and I realized. It was like an a almost animated. That exactly. Actually, yeah. I realized that there was an incredibly rapid shutter speed that gave you sequences of pictures, these bursts of pictures that were like, uh, maybe you know, 10, 12 frames per second. And, and I, it was one of those moments where you just go, I, I want I, it all. I don't like, want to say bad words on yeah. the program. But. No, you can you can say as many as you want, Dory. Well, I guess it's not a big deal. It's like, damn, yeah. that's I, you know, I, and suddenly I, it, the, the those sequences of pictures just sucked me into the moment, and uh, and and I thought, I have to I have to work with these because these are unique and uh, and and they're such, you know, whether uh, the, the the security camera footage, as I said, is distancing, and this is this is, it sucks you in and it, it really places you. In that, in the world of what's happening. Yeah. Well, you, you bring up sort of an interesting question that I have as somebody who's worked on films like this, and you're dealing with the survivors, and you're hearing their intimate stories. How difficult is it to keep the film itself so um, non-biased, so to speak, not interjecting your opinion? Because, like, I found myself watching it and just being like, "What the fuck is going on with the SWAT teams and all that sort of stuff?" Like, yeah. that's part of what makes it such an amazing mm. human piece. Is mm. like, you know, when those Plain Coast police are just like, "We need to get in there and do something." Yeah. Um, but like, you just you take it honestly. You're like, they didn't do anything. Mm. Three hours in, they're not mm. doing anything. Mm. Like, how challenging it is it to not just be like, "This is fucking crazy." Right. Like, this yeah. is just this makes no sense. Yeah. I, I think that moments like that are more even more powerful when there's no judgment involved. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone, you know. Everyone's reaction will be what? What the hell? I mean, what were they thinking? Uh, you know. But at the same time, you know, no one woke up in the morning. None of those military guys or the police guys woke up in the morning and said, "You know what? Let's just completely bungle a terrorist attack a response to a terrorist attack today." So no one. It's something that happens, and and so I'm very 
where he also as an outsider as a you know as a you know uh, uh, <laughs> you don't want to go and be from... like so you fuck that up yeah. huh? <laughs> well the former colonial power you know the, a British guy saying you, you guys uh, uh, messed it up but but at the same time you know people bled to death because because of this terrible lack of urgency that, that, that Right. I mean, I think you're right that nobody goes into it and wants to be like, oh, I'm going to bungle this. But at the same time, like nobody's like, I'm going to be a hero today and do that. And that's what one of the things that makes like, especially like those businessmen who just go in with the yeah. cops just because they yeah. have gun licenses. Yeah. They're like, we yeah. got to do this. And it's yeah. just like, though the braveness of people like that mm. probably, I, don't, I mean, I can't calculate exactly how many lives something like that mm. might have saved, but they probably they, saved. guys saved hundreds of lives, yeah. literally, because, uh, yeah. you know, if they hadn't kept, if they hadn't kept the terrorists tied up, where they where they did, they would have moved deeper into the supermarket. Yeah. And there were hundreds of people hiding there who, who managed to get out during the during the gunfight. So, yeah, I mean, I I don't generally adopt a judgmental tone because I, I don't I don't think it helps, and I don't think, you know, what would I have done in that situation? Would I really have been so much better? I don't know. So I, I always think of it in those terms, and I think also understatement can be very damning without being you know stru- too strident. I think I think you know you have to deliver that. You have to deliver the truth of the situation, and. If it's accurate and if it's well told and it's well supported by by evidence, by pictures, by testimony, then it's it's as powerful as it needs to be. You know, one of the aspects of the film that I mean, obviously, is the least defined, but probably the most challenging to even attempt to uh, get into is the perspective from the terrorists. Obviously, right. all the ones there are dead. I don't know who you could interview to actually give you an honest perspective from their point of view. But one of, I mean, hearing the stories from the people who survived and interacted with them, like how they give candy bars to the kids yeah. and say, we're sorry yeah. about this yeah. and stuff like that, or make baby faces at babies yeah. and stuff like that. It's just like, to try and understand, like, what is actually going on yeah. in these people's minds that they can sort of, like, combine all these different perspectives mm-hmm. into a, a cohesive element in their mind. Yeah. Um, like I can kill you, but I'm gonna give your kid a candy bar, and it's sort of like, like, I, like, is that a, a frustration as a filmmaker that you probably can never really find a way to get well, that explained? Yet, yet, yet again, Spencer, I'm gonna refer you back to Terror in Mumbai because the phone <laughs> calls, yeah, and stuff because like that, that was all about that was all about the perpetrators, and that was all about trying to understand the mindset and the relationships that created the space where these guys could do what they did. Which is interesting because that is sort of relevant in this film because you talk about it very. Or, at various times that they appear to be calling back to, was it Somalia? I yeah. don't remember. Um, to get like status updates or suggestions yeah. on what they want yeah. him to do or whatever. So, yeah. I mean, there is an element to that in this film. We just aren't entirely sure no. what was being trained. No. And I kind of had, you know, I, I, I started seeing the three films, Moscow, Mumbai, and The Mall, as a kind of trilogy. Uh, and, a very and, sad trilogy, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, a, a, a very tragic trilogy. Yeah, I sort of wonder, like, why, why have I done this? Why have I focused on these? Uh, I seem to be drawn to it. Although, you know, my, my I think phenomenal my, stories. I mean, well, thank you, but uh, they are, yeah. And and these stories are so rich and and so revealing of how people are when pushed to extremes. And I mean, you know, these are all every single story in each in all of those films. Every single one of the amazing stories that people tell about their time in the midst of a terrorist attack is is so rich you could almost write a novel about that person and, and the before and after and you know and, and, and I'm just showing a tiny slice of what they experienced and yet yet it's resonant because when it's combined with all the other the other witnesses there's a kind of collective uh, like a, 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 a collective uh, feeling that comes from those all those experiences that, that, that are shared well that I mean that's a good point but raises an interesting question. What is it like in terms of trying to get people to talk about these? I mean, it's one thing to just show news footage and comment on it and be like, look, here's this person. There they are again. Like, yeah. But you're actually like literally having the survivors talking about yeah. it. Like, oh, this is where my wife was shot. She died here. Yeah. Like, and here's where I was shot. Yeah. And it's just like, I can't imagine asking those questions, let alone talking about, oh, yeah. this was when I was shot and it yeah. went through my body and came yeah. out my pelvis or whatever. It's, I mean, I'm in awe. That woman in particular, the, the mother of two, Amber, um, I, you know, I'm still in awe of her because, partly because she's able to articulate so calmly what happened to her that day um, without being matter of fact and dry. You know, she, she doesn't. No, I mean, she, they're, she's, they're all, I mean, yeah. incredibly 
earnest and it's i mean it's almost like you're like did a tragedy happen mm. to these people because mm. they're so matter of fact mm. about a lot of it mm. i mean honestly mm. i think you know these uh, every one of the the people interviewed in the program every one of them has by then had, had quite a long time to reflect on, that's on a good what point happened. yeah um and it's interesting i often turn up you know late and I, I i'm not there when it's just happened and so I think that gives each film uh, a particular quality because everyone, everyone has, has really processed or, st or tried to grapple with the experience and they've done a lot of thinking and it makes the films quite thoughtful, I think. Do you uh, think it is affected at all by the region that they're in or their experiences of that? Because, I mean, you think about, like, terrorist attacks. Like, thankfully, I mean, knock on wood, the U.S. has been pretty lucky. So it's like... But that might be a region where, some, or that I mean, that whole area where that kind of stuff is a much more common occurrence. I mean, mm. you think about some place like Jerusalem. It's like, mm. how can you live in a place where it's constantly under mm. a threat state? And I don't know if it's becoming numb to it or accepting that as a part of life. Or I, I don't know. Like, do you think that is an element in how they're able to I, cope with these? Kind I of do. Things? I mean, I think once you once you once you've gone through that kind of event, you, you become there's an intimacy with it, and and so it becomes it doesn't become normal, but it becomes something that you inhabit and something that you own to, to a certain you earn that experience and, and so therefore you're no longer reacting to it emotionally in the same way as someone who, who's, who's hearing about it for the first time so, so yeah there is a particular quality to the way people talk about uh, these events and I think it's also helped by the fact that by the time I sit down with them I've met them before I've sat down and I've spoke I, I've tried not to uh, do the interview before I do before I do the interview because uh, you, know, people you want could, to keep it up fresh you want to keep it fresh people often can only really do it you don't once want it to, to feel you. rehearsed yeah. I mean. but, um, but at the same time they know they understand that that, that I'm familiar with the geography with the with, I'm familiar with what happened with the before and after with who was around them and that kind of gives the interviews I think a different quality because it's like they're talking to me about something that I also know um, and, and I think that helps as well there's a kind of intimacy in the interviews which you might not get if you just kind of that's a good point stuck people in front of a camera in a studio one of the interesting elements of the movie is it it doesn't really have a heck of a lot to the epilogue um, which is interesting because it sort of very much feels like makes it feel like a moment in time but I think some of the most shocking profound footage to me was after seeing this place burned to the ground, like where there's like crater essentially and there's all those cars and stuff like that. How challenging is it in terms of trying to dive into like the fallout from an event like this? Because I mean, that feels like where do you sort of cut that off? I mean, you could go on forever and be like, this person did this the next year. Yeah. This person, like, but like in, at the same time, like how, like, I, I mean, I remember hearing about that shooting, but I didn't realize like the entire building burned to ground. Mm. I didn't realize like it was a complete crater there. Then like, you know, was it the president? I don't remember who came on and was yeah, saying like, yeah. we did it. We stopped them. And it was like, are you, are you fucking serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. like one of the most absurd, like yeah. celebrations of yeah. success yeah. after like, 60, 70 people had died. Mm -hmm. It's been a catastro catastrophic event. Like, it's, it was such an amazing thing to watch this thing wrap up, but at the same mm -hmm. time, you don't just like continue on too yeah. far once it's ended. Yeah. Well, that, that was, uh, the, the ending was difficult. I mean, I, for me, what was striking was that, you know, both sides, the Kenyan government and the Somali, the Shabab, Success. Were, they were both, yeah, yeah uh, you know, having a brag about, about how well they did. Um, and, and clearly, the only the only result was 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 obscene Grizzly, tra yeah. and tragic and and you know because Al Shabaab had sent these four boys to die, you know, uh, and 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 they, they slaughtered. I mean, most most of the people they killed were lying on the floor, you know, face down. And, and I mean, it's a lot of women, a lot really, of children, a lot of women and children. It was really obscene. Yeah. The obscenity of this attack was something that struck me really, really. You could probably say that about any terrorist attack, but for some reason, being at a mall on a Saturday lunchtime with families and kids, this was particularly obscene. Um, but yeah, so ending the film, I wanted to have the sense that you know everyone crowed about you know how well they'd done, and, and of course, it's not a victory for anyone. Um, by that time in the story, it had been quite a long time since we'd been with our main protagonists, you know, and I found it difficult to wrap up the story. I found it it was a, it's, in a way it's a very bleak, it's such a bleak story. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very hard to wrap up. And I just wanted a sense. I think we needed to hear from Amber because I mean, we needed to hear how she felt having had some time to think about these men and what they'd done and what they, what they meant to her. 
And then I also wanted to hear from the plainclothes policeman, Corporal Ali, because I felt, you know, he was... Tremendously you know, instrumental in trying he to was, do that. He was. And I think having seen such incompetence and such bungling from the Kenyan security forces, you needed to see that, that there was a Kenyan guy who was... You well, know, not, who, not who just Kenyan, but Muslim as well. And it was just like, yeah. this is... This is ridiculous yeah. that they're trying to perpetrate yeah. this in the name of Allah. It's just like, it's, I mean, yeah. And, and you know, if I find them, I'm going to, as long as I have the yeah. strength to pull the trigger. That was, that was <laughs> a great quote. Yeah, that was a phenomenal quote. <laughs> but I thought it was important to include that because I think, you know, he he's also Kenyan. He's, he, he's a, a Kenyan patriot and he's a Muslim and a, and a devout Muslim. And, you know, I think it's so important to, to balance what we've seen with that reality that's also well, I also think it speaks to just the terrorism I mean they can say that this is all in the name of Allah yeah. and blah 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 but like I mean tons of Muslims were murdered in this yeah. as well like yeah. I mean this is clearly a tragedy for everyone it's easy for us in America to be like oh we don't want the Muslims coming because mm -hmm. those are the terrorists and stuff like that and it's like mm -hmm. No, that, that that is the fanatical portion. Mm. They're fanatical Christians that worry me sure. as well. So like, and most of Al Shabaab victims are Muslims. You know, yeah, in, in that's Somalia. So I want to say it was a difficult film to end. You know, it had uh, the, the Mumbai film has a wonderful ending. Uh, you really got to watch it. <laughs> I'm even more curious now. <laughs> but that's because you know the the it's partly because the terrorists' voices mm. became the main protagonists in the the main actors in the film and and. Uh, and so I was able to end it with something, a last word from them, if you like. In, at the mall, all four terrorists died. There's, there was no, there's very little trace. We know, actually very little is known about them because I did quite a bit of research and tried to, you know, push as far as I could into trying to find out their identities and, and where they come from and what their experience of life was before they well, carried not, out. Well, not society. only difficult to find out, but like, isn't it something like the last 48 hours of their life basically unknown? You have like one shot and be like, this is the last recorded image yeah. of the terrorists. It's yeah. like how long between that till when the actual storming of the building occurred? It was a pretty was decent a long time. Long yeah. time. So yeah. it's like yeah. there's 40 hours of what occurred there that we have no idea exactly. what was going on. Yeah. And probably yeah. never will, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. So. There's a kind of weird banality. I mean, I, I, uh, they would, you know, they, they were holed up in this furniture storeroom on the first floor, and that, you know, from time to time, you'd see them sneak down to the um, the dairy counter uh, like and had, grocery gra store, grab yeah. a yogurt, and you know, have some snacks. They obviously got a bit, you know, got a bit hungry, got the munchies, and then sort of they would wander around a bit and <laughs> get back up. And it was bizarre. It's, it's a really, you know, quite a. It's it's hard for us to wrap our heads around how that kind of thing could happen. No, that's absolutely. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know the security camera footage for me was was the real prize in, in as a filmmaker for sure, and the thing which made this something that I was willing to you know. I, there's almost no end to how many hours you could put into watching that footage and rewatching it and watching every frame because yeah. in, in most of it nothing happens. You know, once <laughs> once the attack has has run its course for the first four hours. And most of the people who've been killed, who were going to get killed, then then very little happened. But there's also those subtle ones that, like, you know, where they're hiding underneath the the display, and it's just like yeah. you only see the very subtle little actions, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff makes such a profound yeah. element of it that I yeah. mean, you have to look and find yeah. those. And it's just like yeah. that's why I appreciate you yeah. sacrificing the time yeah. to do that because it's such an arduous job. Great. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I hope the, the I hope the audience well, you know will. Well, let, let's let's get this out here. So. Uh, Terror in the Mall uh, being, um, I believe, produced, distributed by HBO. Uh, what is the release plan for it in case people want to get out there and watch this? And you absolutely should. Well, if people want to watch this, it's, it's uh, on HBO at, I think, 9 p.m. on Monday, the 15th of September. Brilliant. Uh, that's Eastern Time. Um, Everyone can use a guide nowadays. <laughs> if they can't find it, they're doing something wrong. Uh, and I believe it will be repeated at regular intervals on HBO thereafter. Uh, I believe it's also going out on, going out on uh, in a 90-minute slot on CNN. Wow! So uh, I'm hoping it will be unedited, you know, un un unabridged. Uh, and that I think is on the 26th of September. So you know, CNN is, a, is, that, is yeah. another Time Warner company. So I think they're sharing they're sharing the film, which is great because it gives it an extra lease of life. Oh, totally. Uh, if you're in the UK, the BBC is is broadcasting it on BBC Two Network Television at nine o'clock, which is very bold. I think very brave. It's a it's a quite a difficult film to watch. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, and you know, I'm hoping it'll be 
maybe it'll be released on DVD or whatever. Oh, I'm sh- nowadays, like I'm sure soon enough it'll be Netflix, HBO Go, all that sort of stuff. No doubt about that. I hope so. Um, Thank you so much. Check out Terra in Moscow, too, and I'm going to check out Terra in Mumbai. Mumbai. Let's both do that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, one last thing. What uh, do you have coming up that you might want to have people keep their eyes out for after this? And is there any place, social media-wise, or anything that they can keep tabs with you on terms of what you're working on? And stuff well, like I, I, uh, yeah, I have a production company called Amos Pictures. That's AMOS Pictures. Uh, and there's a website which is kind of... Which needs over, it's going to be overhauled in the next couple of weeks. And if you go there, you should be able to you know, watch a few of my films and, and find out what's going on. Uh, I have a, a really fascinating project coming up, uh, which is going to be broadcast in, in the UK. Uh, not in the States, I don't think, yet. But, uh, it's in, always how it feels. <laughs> always how it feels. But in the UK, it's called The Pedophile Hunter. And it's the story of a vigilante group, amazing characters. It's, it's a documentary, it's, 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 and it's... It's something that I've filmed myself uh, and observed. You know, it's, I've been kind of embedded with a vigilante group of <laughs> pedophile hunters. I, and, and poor America stuck with, like, to catch a predator. Well, it's interesting you say that because <laughs> they are kind of doing what to catch a predator did, but they're doing it on a completely, you know, vigilante amateur, basis. vigilante basis, but using social media to, to expose uh, sexual predators. So it's been more than a year in the making. It's, I think it's a, a fascinating film. Uh, so that's what's coming get, up. Get it to UK, America! Come on, let's start the campaign now. <laughs> I'd uh, yeah, I'd love it to go. I think I think I think people out here in the states would relate to it. You know, I think, oh, yeah, uh, for sure. It's just the, the 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 accents, the Midland accents, which might be a difficult bit difficult to understand. We'll, we'll dive very quickly. Let yeah. me assure you, we're we're totally good for that sort of stuff. Did you, like, guys, did you guys? What did you what uh, did you watch Train Spotting when it came out oh, years ago? Oh yeah. You yeah. could cope with the accents yeah, and that. We're good. Yeah, we um, snatch all that sort of stuff. We're, we're at this point. Okay. We can do it. Yeah. I mean, we've been around for Excellent. a while. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Right. Best nice of one. luck with Terror Thanks, in the Spencer. Mall. And uh, can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks, mate. Awesome. Nice one. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.